Uh, I would now like to call on Mr. Kamal Wadham College to close the case for the proposition. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone for their impassioned speeches, especially the people on the proposition side. You've made my job a lot easier. I'd like to begin by applauding Professor Charmley for his um, indication that we should seek balance in this debate. But I want to firmly suggest that facts are not neutral and truth is not neutral. And with that, I'd like to begin with the first point of rebuttal that one of the previous opposition speakers said. There is no altruism in empire. There's only evil. And I firmly want you to keep that in mind throughout my speech. When we're asking whether we should be ashamed of Churchill, it is important to ask exactly how we're judging this man. What exactly are we judging him on? Yes, there are portraits of him as a whimsical grandfather, and, and I'm sure he was absolutely loving. But I'm not interested in Churchill as a grandfather, or a saint, or a husband. I am judging Churchill as the man at the head of a country which occupied half the world, and which has come to symbolize an entire system. This debate is about more than just one man. This debate is about what one man has come to symbolize. This debate is about an entire machine that systematically oppressed and suppressed in the name of king and country. No man was more forthright in this version of patriotism than Winston Churchill himself, and we need to ask serious questions. Now, for me, there is no need to use flavored rhetoric, grand claims, or even exaggerated storytelling to undermine the fragile facade of Churchill's image. The facts are the facts. Throughout Churchill's notorious career, he has left a dark legacy through his actions, but also importantly, through his indifference. I think, as the previous speaker mentioned, Barack Obama had the right idea by removing his bust from the Oval Office. I can only fathom what the former Prime Minister would have made of the first black president of the United States. Now, before I get into the substance of my argument, I want to mention a very personal anecdote, as previous speakers have, which makes this entire debate so important to me. My great-great-grandparents were born in a small village called Begum Sarai, near Lucknow in India. They lived a relatively peaceful life in one of the more multicultural parts of the British Raj. Yes, the Hindus used to go to their temples, the Muslims to their mosques, the Sikhs to their gurdwaras, and the British occasionally to their country houses in the foothills of the Himalayas. <laughs> a veneer of calm had eventually suffocated India after decades of imperial rule. However, in 1857, there was a member of our family that we still speak about until this day, a member of our family who, yes, took part in what British textbooks call the Indian Mutiny, but more enlightened circles would call it the War for Independence. So after the effort for freedom was ultimately unsuccessful, there was a massive effort to clamp down on the dissidents that caused this discomfort to the British Raj and the British Empire. British soldiers came knocking at the door. His grandmother pled with them. The rest is history. The opposition will no doubt ask why I am bringing up an example that predates Churchill's birth by 20 years. The answer is simple. Churchill himself summarized this in a 1937 statement when he told the Palestine Ro Royal Commission, I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a wiser race, to put it that way, has come in and take their place. There is no doubt that Churchill thought that the white race was superior to other races, as previous speakers have so eloquently put, and that, that is why it moves me to debate this very British figure in this very British institution. Indeed, the very fact that our previous president at the Union and our current librarian, Shivani, as well as her predecessor, are all females hailing from the country which Churchill had such a disdain for shows how far we have come as a country. Churchill questioned whether colored people had it within them to rule themselves, I wish he could see the world today. He described Hindus as windbags and had this to say about the country that is on the brink of overtaking the UK in terms of GDP. I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. He had many more horrendous views, some of which have been aired by very eloquent speakers today, which we seem to forget because he happened to hold up his two fingers when Britain was at war. I'm sure he felt a heartfelt sorrow for the three million Indians who sacrificed their lives for Britain in World War II. Yes, to defeat tyranny, but also to win back their freedom from their imperial masters. This brings me on to Churchill himself and his participation in the countless atrocities of the empire. In my speech, I will seek to address three reasons as to why we should all hang our heads in shame at Churchill's glorification. 
Firstly, I will highlight some of the atrocities that Mr. Churchill was complicit in and his leadership directly contributed to. Secondly, I want to draw a strong link between the glorification of Churchill and the sanitization of the British Empire. They are in many ways inextricably linked because Churchill's career navigated both the height of imperial evil as well as its eventual decline. Finally, I want to discuss the repercussions of our ignorance to the truth about Churchill. In our curriculums, we are presented the empire in a balanced way, if such a way really existed. We are given the light skirting of slavery, a brief allusion to the Amritsar massacre, while simultaneously we are pummeled with a sense of manifest destiny at the Englishman's zealotry in wanting to change the world for the better. To begin with, Churchill's expansive career is punctuated with complicity in horrendous crimes, and so it was hard for me to pick one to truly describe the horror that many of us may be listening to for the very first times. Previous speakers have spoken eloquently about the Bengal famine, but there are countless other examples. I wonder whether his description would be more apt for invading British armies when he described people of the northwest of India as, a, as having a strong aboriginal propensity to kill. However, there are two prime examples for Churchill's lust to oppress. Both take part in completely disparate, disparate parts of his career. The first is during the Boer War. Churchill charged, a Churchill charge defended imper imperial atrocities with an unhinging will willingness. When concentration camps were built in South Africa for white Boers, he spoke of the minimum suffering the British officers enabled. However, when at least 115,000 black Africans were swept into British camps, where 14,000 people died, he wrote of his irritation that Kafirs should be allowed to fire on white men. And after returning to Britain, of course, he wistfully wrote in his memoirs, it was a great fun galloping about. Now, I want to address Churchill's relationship with the British Empire. It would be foolish to suggest that Churchill was propelled by anything other than a zealous belief in his superiority when dealing with subjects of the British Empire. Some of the most malicious acts of the empire were directly condoned by Winston Churchill. He has been criticized for ad advocating the use of chemical weapons, particularly against the Kurds and the Afghans, as we've heard. And yet, in his memoirs, he wrote, I cannot understand this squeamishness about the use of gas. And so now it falls upon me to try and bring together all the proposition arguments. And I want you to remember what the proposition says. I want to address what it would mean to ignore the dark side of Winston Churchill. It is clear to me that this country is great. We do live in a great Britain. However, we are not great because of our worship of such morally bankrupt figures. We are great because of our ability to learn. And to learn, we must face the truth. The empire was one of the darkest chapters of this country's history and has left an eerie legacy in Pakistan, India, Kashmir, South Africa, and Palestine. Churchill was a protagonist in many of these calamities, and it is through Churchill we should learn, but much more from his failures than his victories. Thank you very much.